So your kids are acting absolutely bananas. And at some point you have to ask yourself, is this behavior a can't or a won't? And what do I even mean by that? Let's get into it. My name is Lauren and this channel is called Lauren Fosters where we talk about all things foster care and adoption related. As always these videos are coming from the perspective of not only me being former foster youth myself but also being a foster and adoptive mom. I have 10 kiddos, 6 of whom I adopted out of the foster care system. I'm by no means a mental health expert other than the fact that I've walked down this road with um, each of my kids. Um, it's something that I've had to deal with and struggle with in my life. Um, so I'm just kind of giving you my own personal perspective and also in this video we're going to be talking a lot about behavior and please understand that we're just touching like the tip of the iceberg. Uh, this is a huge, complicated, vast conversation with a lot of elements involved. So we're just, we're just going to touch on one little aspect of it. But when I um, could kind of narrow things down to something I like to call can'ts and won'ts, it really kind of opened the door um, to simplify uh, my thought process when I was dealing with my children's behaviors. So hopefully it does that for you as well. When we go through this discussion, you'll kind of see, okay, maybe, maybe I can break it down a little for myself. So it doesn't feel so overwhelming because I know as a foster parent, as an adoptive parent this is a really hard walk that we choose it's not um, it, it's not an easy walk and, and look this is a this is a conversation that might be for biological parents even maybe this is a conversation um, for um, even people you're dealing with day to day your spouse even I've, I've had to ask that question the can'ts and won'ts question um, even about my own spouse um, or even about myself even to myself is this a can't or is this a won't and if you're saying Lauren just get to it what's this can't or won't we'll get into that right now but real quick I do want to say if you are new here welcome it is so nice to have you as part of our community please hit the like button please hit the subscribe button and um, and be part of our conversation um, we'd love to have you here you're welcome to comment down below um, and share your story I'd love to hear it I do read the comments and um, so yeah welcome anyway let's get into can'ts and won'ts and here's what I mean by that okay so I, I'm not gonna get in too big into the science of brain uh, development and um, chemicals and that kind of thing because once again I'm not a mental health professional um, and I do think those resources are out there if you want to look into them um, but when we think about the brain we kind of think okay this is the way I've always described it like when we're in um, the front of our brain we're 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 living life we're focused we're kind of our true calm normal self we're in a place where we can learn we're in a place where we can take in information um, we're, we're in a place where we can reason right this is our calm place to be um, but when our um, systems all worked up um, maybe we're having anxiety we're, we're suffering with depression maybe something especially something has triggered us that's when we start going towards the back of our brain and when you see a child or any human that is just completely triggered um, that's back in their fight flight or freeze right so um, I'm sure everyone here has heard that term fight flight freeze um, so typically if, if something's triggering us you'll see people um, get really agitated um, you might see um, a kid um, almost seem angry, um, maybe weepy or sad, um, and, or they might just freeze in their track. They may look like a deer caught in the headlights. So that's what I mean by fight, flight, or freeze. And here's the deal. When a child, and, and I'm going to keep saying when a child, but once again, this is across the board. This could be your coworker, your husband. You may find, you might want to try to recognize this within yourself. Um, when something has triggered someone and now they're back in fight, flight, or freeze, there's no reasoning with that human being. So, um, and, and I see this a lot. Well, my kid didn't do the thing I wanted them to do so I yelled at them and then when I yelled at them they got agitated and they got um, angry they just froze they wouldn't even answer me and then a punishment ensues so I'm gonna try to kind of get you to think about that just a little bit differently okay so um, let's say you've got a child that is triggered by loud noise triggered by um, shame feelings triggered by um, getting in trouble in general fear failure whatever okay um, so now you've asked this child to do something they have not accomplished this task you start yelling and um, that has triggered this child who is now back in fight flight or freeze so all the reactions coming out of that child in that moment are not personal they're not to you they're not um, I think a lot of times as parents we go they're being defiant um, they're not yes sirring they're not looking me in the eyes and we'll talk about that in just a moment as well but um, 
but they're reacting out of a scared, fearful place. So you're not gonna get this kind of like sound, calm, peaceful reaction that you might be looking for um, if a child is triggered. And I brought up the eye contact thing because that's another one I see a lot, um, especially with my kids with ADHD that kind of can't keep their eyes locked in on something, or my kids that are a little triggered by eye contact, um, maybe that's something that has been a scary thing in the past for them. Um, eye contact is not necessarily something I expect. Um, so I, I try to say, um, can I see your eyes? Um, eyes right here. Um, but if my child is all over the place, I have to ask myself, what's the end goal of this conversation? Is that I need them to um, complete this task? Um, really what I need them to do is regulate. So, um, so, so I don't expect that eye contact per se. Um, and, and I think that's a trigger for a lot of us adults. Well, they wouldn't even look me in the eye, but I would, I would venture to say, if you look maybe at your own triggers, that could be a trigger for you. And so try not to get triggered when your kids are being triggered. Cause as the adults, we're their co-regulators. So, um, a child may not know how to regulate themselves. I, as an adult who has had struggles with, um, depression and anxiety in the past, who has, who has my own hangups and my own triggers in life. Um, I have learned grounding techniques. I have learned coping techniques and, and calming techniques. Um, my eight year old may not have those abilities yet. My, my six, 16 year old you know that's fresh out of foster care may not have those coping skills yet um, so those are up to me not only to teach them but also to um, to kind of emulate for them um, when they see me get triggered and they see me get worked up what can I do um, to calm down what can I do to ground myself and I think that's okay for our kids to see that by the way I think it's healthy and I think that your kids need to see that they need to see how you cope um, but what I mean by co-regulators is for my kids that really just don't have it figured out it might mean Mean, me trying to learn my child well enough to know um, this child has a lovey that is the only thing that calms this child down. Um, I don't mind that my child has a lovey. Um, maybe uh, my child uh, just needs to walk away from a conversation, which once again for us parents can be such a huge trigger. We're going, why, why do they need a minute? So I give my kids permission to say, I need a minute. Like, can, can I just have a minute to like think this through? And I do tell them, I say like conversation, not over. Um, we'll, we'll talk about this in the future, but yes, you can walk away. I have one uh, little guy I want to bring up that um, has to go outside and scream. And I know that sounds crazy and it sounds so inappropriate, but uh, he gets very overwhelmed with math. Okay. Um, and so when he's in the middle of some math problems, he just can't figure it out. Uh, he just can't figure it out. There are times he has to take a deep breath and he goes outside and he just lets a scream out, which I'm sure the neighbors just think we're the weirdest people on the planet. And then he comes back in, takes another deep breath, sits his little self down and he gets back to work. And you know what? It may not be my favorite coping mechanism. And I would hope that at some point he has some better coping mechanism to replace that with. But right now, if that's the coping mechanism, it's a lot better than chucking the computer across the room or hurting a sibling or saying mean things. So I'll take it. Okay, so now you're probably asking, what does that have to do with can'ts and won'ts? Okay, so let's say we take a behavior. Um, a kid does not want to um, do their homework, okay? Um, so is this a can't or is this a won't? So is this an I can't do this right now? Like I just physically, mentally, emotionally cannot do this right now or is this a won't and a won't would be something like we're looking at it as defiance like they just are like too bad so sad I'm not doing that you can't make me do that and and that's that so I'm gonna be talking a lot about can'ts but it, that's not to say that there aren't won'ts and that's where you really have to learn your child because what I don't want to say is assume everything's a can't and then um, we just let those won'ts fly and then our kids just getting away with murder because there are the times that my kids really are showing what could look like a can't moment and it's really just a won't they just really really don't want to so I really have to zone that in but I will say I've never had my kids try to manipulate and take advantage of that either I don't say out loud is this a can't or is this a won't although I don't think that verbiage would be inappropriate to say to a child especially a, like an older child a teenager like hey buddy is is this a can't or is this a won't? Because if this is a won't, I kind of need you to get down to business. But if this is a can't, let's talk about it. Let's figure out what, what's the hang up here? What's the wall standing in the way of you getting whatever this is done, done. So say once again, we're talking about getting that homework done. Um, so a won't obviously, okay, you're being defiant. Let's, let's get through that. And, and I think as a parent, you, you decide how you're going to parent your kid through 
just defiance. But I would like to venture to say that there's a lot more can'ts, especially with our kids that come from hard places, than we actually realize is what's going on. One of my kids had a really, really hard time um, in about first grade. Um, he had gotten placed in my home. He was doing okay in school already um, from his previous foster home. Um, and once he moved into my foster home, he stayed within the same school system, same class, everything. Um, so it should have felt like a pretty seamless transition when it came to school. But as some of you that have been doing this for a while know that any kind of movement, especially to a new home, could kind of trigger something. So you, you were bound to see some behaviors even in school and that kind of thing. But he seemed okay. Like he did okay in school for a while. And then kind of out of nowhere, as the case was rolling along and decisions were being made, um, you know, all those little things they pick up on that we don't think they pick up on, um, his behavior got out of control. And it got to the point where he was um, flipping desks and screaming at the teacher and hiding under his desk and not listening. And, and frankly, kind of scaring his classmates which made it hard for him it was kind of the spiral because he was like none of my classmates love me and then it makes him angry and then when he's angry it scares his classmates and then they don't want to be friends with him and you can see how that just kind of spirals around and around but there became a point where I started going okay is this him just really trying to fight being here and him just trying to get out of this or is there something else going on here and that's where I needed to be a good student of my child um, later down the line through therapy and, and that kind of thing we found out he was having um, possible panic attacks and um, he was also just being triggered by the environment itself um, so I, at, in a public school setting and once this is a different video for another time I just want to stick with the cancer and wounds, um, you know, we set up an area for him, a calm down area. We did all the things, had all the things in place, but nothing was working. In fact, I would venture to say it got worse. We couldn't even drop him off. Um, it was hard to get him out of the car um, without like him wanting to wrestle his way back into the car. And then the people at the school had kind of had it and they didn't want to get into a wrestling match getting him into the school. So it was kind of this big thing, but that's when it became less of a, this is not a, I won't behave. This is an, I can't behave. And once it becomes about a can't, that's when it's our responsibility as parents to kind of take a step back and go, whoa, 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 whoa. This isn't about, there's no punishment in the world that's going to fix a can't, okay? At this point, we're about calming down. We're about regulating. We're about finding out the reason behind the behavior. We're about trying to put systems into place so that this child feels safe. Um, first things first, every child on the planet, every human on the planet um, needs to feel safe. And, and unless a child feels safe, um, they're not going to ever be truly grounded. And you might be saying, well, why wouldn't my child feel safe. Maybe it's your biological child. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe why wouldn't, why wouldn't this person feel safe? And there's a number of reasons why a person could not feel safe in the environment they're in. Maybe they feel insecure. Maybe something's causing them anxiety. It may have nothing to do with you. It may have to do with the sights and the smells and the sounds. Um, something that reminds them of something that's happened in the past. Um, so no amount of reasoning, no amount of trying to use the front part, the smart part, the calm part of reasoning brain is going to like penetrate when somebody in a triggered moment. Um, once somebody is triggered, we're in camp zone. Once we're in camp zone, um, especially as a parent, it is my job then to co-regulate with my child, try to learn my child well enough to know, hey, what can we do to calm down? And it might take some trial and error to go, um, okay, maybe this child likes um, certain oils or maybe this child ha once again has a lovey. Uh, we, do, we have a kid that just can't live without his lovey, but that lovey, I've seen him go from zero to 60 and then right back down to zero once that lovey's handed to him. Um, so the, it, it could vary per child. Um, having a punching bag, you know, we have one that we hang out in the garage and some of our people just need to get some aggression out, um, you know, but whatever it is, and once again, giving your child permission just to say, you know what, I'm in a camp place right now and I can't have this conversation um, and, and not taking it personally as a parent, like they're just being disrespectful. They're using this as an excuse to walk away. Once again, that's my own hangups. That's, that's my hangup that I'm taking this personally, um, but it's my job as the parent to be the bigger person, go, this isn't about me. This is about something going on with my child. Um, I need them to calm down. But once again, buddy, this conversation is not over, but you are welcome to walk away, calm down, and then we're going to get back to it. So I guess the question is then, why is the can't and won't thing so important, especially without any like permanent solution? Like with any, whoa, when it's a can't, just do this one thing. And all of a sudden, all your dreams will come true. Um, it's not that simple. But the reason I think it's so important to be able to recognize can'ts and won'ts and just have that simple verbiage in your head and maybe even out of your mouth to your child 
myself is because I think it takes a lot of the getting defensive and assuming the worst. I think sometimes we assume the worst in our kids and, and I think sometimes when we dig a little deeper, we find that it's really like it has nothing to do with us. It's maybe it's not because our kids are like bad kids necessarily or or trying to like put themselves out there as as mean or defiant. Um, maybe they just are having an extremely hard time regulating themselves. I've had a lot of moments where kids have lashed out and, and really at me. I hate this. I hate you. Doors slam. This kind of thing. And once you start peeling back those layers and you go, wait a minute, this is not about me. There is something going on here and we're going to figure that out. And no, I don't want my door slammed. No, I don't want my property damaged. And no, I don't want anybody here to get hurt, including the child hurting themselves in the process of, you know, working through these emotions. I don't want those things to happen. So I do need to make sure they're safe first. Um, but then I need to make sure they feel safe um, and calm or, or anything I say is just not going to resonate at all. Um, also, I, I'm just going to throw this in there and this is not even on the topic of can't or won't. Um, if, if you're expecting your child to give you a certain answer before walking away from a conversation, please understand that you're kind of setting them up to give you what you want to hear. So if you're saying, um, you, you know you did something wrong, right? You know it, don't, and then they, they know they can't walk away until they say, I know I've done something wrong. I mean, I, I want my kids to recognize when they've done something wrong as well, but I also, there is a point where I have to recognize if I'm forcing my child to use my verbiage, then they might just be giving me lip service to end the conversation. So if, if I kind of see that us going down that path, that's a great time to say, look, I can tell you're not in a good place. I can tell that your, your head's swimming, that you aren't feeling safe right now, that you're worried about what I am hoping you say. So why don't we take a break? And, um, and, and go calm down, have a drink of water, have a snack, and let's get back to this when you're in a calmer state. So I just wanna throw that little disclaimer in there um, that if you're kind of forcing them to walk away with certain verbiage, then expect to just hear what you wanna hear, but that doesn't mean they believe the words actually coming out of their mouth. Once again, this works with spouses. This works with me, with myself. Lauren, I'm really scared to do this thing. So, okay, but wait a minute, is this a can't or a won't? Like, is it that I, I don't wanna do it because like I'm being lazy or is like, this is like a real anxiety trigger. Um, and, and so I've had to ask myself that question um, I with my husband, right? He comes home, maybe he's cranky, it's been a long day at work and wait, 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 is this a can't or a won't? Like, it, it, like if he can't, um, handle life right now because maybe, um, you know, his boss grumped at him and all, all of his soldiers were doing bad things or whatever, right? Um, and he comes home a little cranky. Is this a can't or a won't? It may not be a won't, but don't we sometimes as spouses kind of just assume it's a won't? Like, why is he not being nice? Why is she being so rude? Um, but wait a minute, maybe this is a can't. And I don't want to make this video at all um, about making excuses for poor behavior. That's something I've declared in my own life that I am not gonna do. I, I, I say to myself and, and I say to others, I am not in the business of making uh, excuses for people's poor behavior. I did that for most of my life, um, especially in childhood, um, growing up in foster care and watching mo my mom make horrible decisions and that kind of thing. And um, and and. But at the same time, I think there's some humanity in going, okay, one, this isn't about me. And two, um, if this person really cannot regulate themselves and really, really um, can't, is not grounded and is not calm, then yeah, you're not going to see this calm, chill person coming before you with like some sort of reasonable state of mind. But once again, that's where you learn your people really well. And you may find that the kid that walks in your house, if you're doing foster care, the kid that walks in your house and the kid you see two years later has a lot less cans. And I think that's such a cool process to watch. I've watched it with every single one of my kids, even the ones that still struggle quite a bit. Um, so, so it's really neat to watch. Therapy is amazing. So when we talk about behavior, I can't stress enough how important I think therapy is. Um, therapy for a child that's gone through trauma, therapy for the kids that walk alongside those kids, maybe your biological kids, your other adopted kids, um, therapy for you and your spouse, maybe if needed um, through seasons that are really, really hard. Um, because this world of foster care adoption is really, really hard. You may need that. You may need that individually. I've gone to my own personal therapy just to have some extra um, space to share my heart um, that is a judgment-free zone that um, isn't just my family. So um, anyway, I hope all of that was helpful. And once again, hit the like, hit the subscribe, and I will see you next time. All right, bye.